Welcome everyone. We're delighted that you could join us today. I imagine we'll have a few more people um, logging on here in the next few minutes as people's schedules um, shift. We're thrilled that you're here for another community conversation. We have a great topic for you today, um, along with wonderful um, speakers on the subject and just a few housekeeping items. Remember to place yourself on mute um, when you're not speaking. And also, if you haven't, we hope that you will um, join us in, join us, register and join us in Arizona for the conference in October. We're excited about it. Um, we already have a couple hundred people or almost a couple hundred people um, registered. So we're really excited to be in, in Arizona for another conference. Can't believe it's already here again after just being in Boise, it feels like a couple months ago, but nonetheless, um, I will turn it over to my co-facilitator, um, I'm the business manager for CFHA, back-end stuff, um, all the front-end um, expertise is Corey. So I'll turn it over to you, Corey. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Tanya. Let me get my slide pulled up here. So I always like to have a little visual aid because as the conversation gets going, you know, sometimes we lose track of what we're talking about. I know I do. Um, so welcome, everyone, uh, to our uh, community conversation on increased acuity. And I think this is such a relevant topic. Um, and I really think this is timely too, because there's been a lot of discussion on the listserv around this. So um, first and foremost, my name is Corey Knight. I am a uh, clinical psychology intern at Community Health of Central Washington. Um, also today, I'm joined by our super participant, Elizabeth Nichol. Nichol, am I pronouncing it right, Elizabeth? Nicole, just like the first name. Nicole. All right, Elizabeth Nicole, my, my apologies. Um, and so, you know, wonderful super participant today. Um, has contributed some to the discussion we've been seeing on increased acuity. Um, so it's an honor to have you. Uh, we always enjoy um, all of our super participants and you know, really to kind of also encourage audience participation. So really with this, you all, we want this to be discussion-based. We want people to kind of unmute, jump in. We'll have a little bit of a free-for-all. Um, so please feel free to you know, unmute, type in the chat, um, really, we, we want this to just be a, like, again, a community conversation that we all can leave here just with something new. Um, so with that, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so, you know, for me, the first thing my mind goes to as we start talking about this idea of acuity, how would you define that? And Elizabeth, I'd love to hear for you kind of what comes to your mind in terms of in increased acuity. Sure. Well, so I've been managing our integrated behavioral health team for eight years now at Summit Health, which is in the uh, primarily in the New Jersey market for most of my career, but we've started to have offices in New York. Um, and as I look at our acuity over these eight years, it was pretty normal that once a month, we might have had someone with severe enough suicidal ideation that we were doing clinical supervision and quickly talking about, do we need to send this person to the hospital? Do we need to send the police? Do we need to call the police? So, you know, once a month was very doable. And in prepping for this a little bit and thinking about what it's been like more in the last couple of months, I would say that we're dealing with two to three of these per day. Um, most recently, uh, I would say the, the highest number in the last couple of weeks was five or six a day. And so wow. these are patients in the primary care space, either speaking about primarily suicidal ideation, although there's been one or two psychotic issues, there's been people who've shown up for appointments drunk, um, we've had um, someone with homicidal ideation, so it's a speckling, but I'm going to say for us, probably 95% falls into the suicidal ideation space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it sounds like there's been this kind of uptick in some of this from what you're seeing, and it sounds like some of these individuals too, I mean, psychosis aside, homicidal, some of this homicidal ideation, are you finding more too that more of these individuals are having to be placed in a kind of mandatory holds because concerns about safety, has that number gone up as well? You know, it's interesting. I think our physicians have come to rely on us mm -hmm. so much that the second that they hear something that makes them nervous, they mm -hmm. call us. So one of the things I've had to work with the team on also is recognizing that we need 
to not catastrophize as we jump on to each of these meetings. Right now, my team is completely virtual. Um, we're doing all our interventions via iPad in um, primary care because we're covering a really large space in New Jersey, uh, 10 counties at the moment. Um, and so, you know, when a doctor hears something that I think many of us as mental health practitioners would be interested in and just want to ask a whole bunch more questions, they stop and immediately call us, right? So what we were finding is, um, you know, someone who's having a little bit of depression uh, in their physical says, yeah, well, you know, I have some days where I just don't want to get up. In fact, sometimes I wish I didn't wake up, right? And immediately the conversation stops and the doctor's typing somebody like get IVH on the phone. Um, so the good news is that a really high number, really high, I mean, anywhere between 95 and 98% of what we're seeing, we're actually not sending to the hospital um, or uh, you know, calling the police on or even necessarily getting family members involved right off the bat. It's just that we've had to get really good at assessing and determining what exactly is going on. Um, and most of the time, um, and in the last year or two, I've trained my team to use the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. So we had something that was a little more um, uh, regulated, uh, evidence-based, um, something that if we all asked the same questions, we would be writing the same information in our notes. Um, and that's been immensely helpful because a lot of times you don't even get past the first question or two because very quickly, the patient says something along the lines of, oh, I would never do that. You know, I'm religious. I am worried about my mother. I have to be there for my dog. Um, I, I want to live. I'm just tired of this post-pandemic life or whatever. Um, so the good news is even though there's acuity and we have to attend to it quickly, um, most of the time it's not ending up with a hospitalization. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that, Elizabeth, you know, as far as that standardization, the communication, you know, really also focusing in on to of really understanding the person, right? And that, you know, just because a flag goes up doesn't mean we have to like sound all the alarms when we do see that flag. Yeah, well, and what's interesting, and I'm not sure if this is the case all over the country, I have to imagine that it is, is even when we are forced to send someone to the hospital, we're finding that the majority of those patients are not kept. Um, you know, they're there maybe for 24 to 36 hours. They finally see a psych resident. And by that point, they're exhausted and just want to go home. And, you know, whether it's that they know to say the right things or they're just assessed as not being perhaps as high acuity as what they're seeing in the hospital. And we end up with them the next day or two days later anyway to figure out now what level of care is going to be best for this person because one session of therapy per week might not be it. Yeah. yeah. Again, I think that's another valuable point. And I mean, my mind in this moment kind of goes to some of the experiences I've had between like Texas and like even where I'm at now in Washington and exactly what you're saying is so true. And in some cases, the wait just to speak with somebody at the, the ED is could be hours, right? Absolutely. And so the person finally gets to see somebody and it's somebody who's overworked, overburdened, who literally is like, does a really quick crisis assessment. Like, all right, you sound safe enough. We're gonna give you some medicine and send you on your way. Yep, yep. Sometimes in, in cases that even we've been a little shocked by, um, mm -hmm. you know, one or two cases we were like, this person is definitely going to be kept. Yeah. And they're back there or their doctors calling us the next day and saying, you know, so-and-so got home from the ER in the mid morning. Can you reach out again? Cause they didn't keep them and we need to figure out next step. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's several kind of examples I can think of in my mind that are reflective of that same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and something else you brought up too is, you know, this kind of increasing acuity given the pandemic and a lot of these other challenges that we've seen too, right? And just, you know, even the last couple of days, some of the work I've done, really getting a sense of these contextual factors that are contributing to the security. So pandemic, inadequate housing, um, some of the challenges that we see for a lot of our patients in terms of job stability, family dynamics, a lot of these things, you know, and it's, unfortunately turned into a uh, 
really a, sit, a situation where we're kind of, th there's more fuel just being thrown on the fire for a lot of these people. We've had lots of communi uh, communication as a team around what the pandemic was doing for people, mm -hmm. but also what this last year has been like. And yeah. I think we'd all agree that anyone that had problems prior to the pandemic, things didn't generally get easier for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, it got much more difficult. Um, you know, if, if a marriage was in trouble before the pandemic and then you're living with the person 24 seven, that made things worse. If you were using substances beforehand, it probably got worse when people weren't looking. Um, if your child was misbehaving, it probably got worse. If your job was bad, maybe now you don't have a job, right? I mean, so many things got worse during the pandemic, but now, um, and I know that in five years, we'll see all kinds of journal articles and there will be names for what I'm about to describe, but there's this almost like a dysthymia with apathy that has sort of resulted in a large percentage of the population. Um, you know, people are not living to the extent that they used to, um, and they've gotten so used to, uh, you know, being homebodies or not being as social or working from home uh, all the time. And as a result, um, I feel like a lot of patients are just describing things that don't necessarily show up exactly on an assessment form, but it's more of just a sentiment of like, I'm not satisfied. Like I just, and, and you know what? I don't really care. It's fine. I just don't care. You know, sort of like a, a lack of motivation um, and little movement towards trying to make oneself feel better. Um, so, you know, sometimes, again, that reflects in what they're saying to the primary care doctors and the primary care doctors are hearing, uh oh, this person might have really severe depression and, and might be suicidal. But when you actually then talk to the patient and you hear what the last couple of years have been like, you can completely understand why they might be struggling in the way that they are. And it's how do you then motivate these people that things could be better than what they are right now? Um, and, and how do we start quickly? And of course, I mean, here being in integrated behavioral health, um, we have to use that little bit of time we have to move people very quickly towards some sort of action. Um, so we did a lot of training during the pandemic also on single session therapy. I mean, kind of using some of that problem solving techniques to really jump right in there with a patient after five minutes to see, could we send this person off with just a little bit of hope and a little bit of pain um, because clearly we're not sending them off to the hospital today. And maybe they don't need something immediately other than to imagine that there's hope and help out there and we're gonna make sure they get it. Absolutely. I mean, again, I love that, you know, that aspect of this work. And I mean, even taking the single session approach, really kind of connecting with the person, having that moment, and then figuring out what's important to them and trying to somehow help them get connected with that, even in a small way, despite everything else that's going on. I think that's one of the most helpful things we can do as behavioral health providers. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and I'd, I'd love to hear some more examples of some of the things that you have continued to do in response to this. And there's some things I can add to that as well. I did want to slow down for a second, ask if any anyone else on this call, you know, has some examples that come to mind regarding inc increased acuity or some things maybe you've noticed in your own clinical work, whether it's direct or administrative or whatever that might be. I'll say something. I'm yeah, we're up in Canada. And, oh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful yeah. Um, we're noticing the increase with acuity is um <laughs> it's it's heading more towards um, a little bit of case management is what we're running into because they're coming in with, you know, comorbid um, lots, just so much going on. And, and so we find ourselves really trying to, you know, do the box method. Of, okay, here's what we can help you with. And this is where we need to connect you with specialized services. Um, even doing that, it, it it's quite challenging. It's, that's what we're experiencing up, up in, we're in Alberta specifically. Okay. I agree 100%. I mean, we just did a strategic planning meeting for my IBH team. And in the top three things that was being asked for from the team, it was more care management, because that's exactly right. We end up doing an awful lot of that, um, you know, what typically would not be part necessarily of the work that we do, but 
there's not necessarily someone else to do it. So we jump in. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think that, you know, Phoebe, thank you so much for that contribution with that. Because, yeah, I think that just, you know, with increased acuity, again, so much of that does come, those basic needs that people have in terms of shelter, safety, food and water, you know, and again, it makes sense why like, hey, I need these things just to get to a place of safety. And I'm in such like panic mode right now that this is what my mind's saying. It's like, hey, there's not a lot of options. Things are looking really bleak. So I think this is such an important thing too, that sometimes if we can get those basic resources set up. It goes so far for so many people. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. All right. All right, so as we're kind of going through some of this, I, I love the contributions so far, and please feel free to type in the chat too. I see something in the chat. What do we got? Um, okay, yeah, Karen, please join in back in when you can. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, we've touched on this a little bit, and I my mind can't help but think there's probably some other kinds of challenges, unique challenges associated with this increased acuity. Um, I know one thing that is coming to my mind is, you know, it's definitely making it more challenging at times to balance patient flows, right? It, especially if we're having to spend a little extra time doing something like a Columbia, or maybe we're doing something like a functional assessment or contextual interview, and we're really having to take that extra time just to establish where the person's at, safety, if we have to assess for any sort of homicidal ideation, really understanding what the risk of that looks like. Um, what might be some of these other challenges that you all have maybe experienced as part of this? Well, I think one of the things from a clinician perspective was I needed to convey to our management team that we needed to give credit from a time perspective to much of the time that's not billable often when you're dealing with one of these situations, right? Yes, of course, we're using a crisis code as we need to. However, the crisis code doesn't necessarily reflect all of the calls that then are made in that day, the next day, um, supervision consultation. I mean, all kinds of different things where you might take someone who truly has suicidal ideation or is in any way, um, you know, psychotic, has a substance abuse problem, et cetera. And it may be four hours of a clinician's time that's spent on this, but on paper, it didn't necessarily look like that, right? So one of the things we've worked on really hard here is, uh, you know, with our IT team also is creating miscellaneous codes that can go into the billing tab and they're not sent off to insurance companies, but instead when reports are run, it really looks like my clinicians are doing the amount of work that they're doing, right? So that was something really important that we did. I think a challenge on the outside and probably everyone's experiencing this across the country is that um, many places we had gone to pre-pandemic are full um, or have lost some of their programming. Um, we've had to be really creative in terms of how to find uh, different services for patients, whether those be intensive outpatient, uh, residential. And so my site, um, I started here 15 years ago in specialty mental health. So we do have a very big behavioral health center at Summit, um, but it's specific in what it does. It only offers CBT and it's a very short-term model. And so anyone, of course, with high acuity doesn't necessarily fit that model. So probably 50% of the patients we speak to and in integrated have to be referred out somewhere um, if we're not keeping them ourselves for a couple of quick sessions or something like that. So um, in addition to uh, virtual becoming very helpful from the standpoint that we could use programs not only all over the state, but in some cases across the country, um, we've really been partnering with some amazing um, companies and organizations out there that offer things like online IOP programs, online um, substance abuse or even eating disorder treatment. Um, we recently have been talking with um, an IOP that's 
really wonderful in its focus is for people 30 and under, right? So really a true young adult population um, because we could no longer just um, send patients to the intensive outpatient program in our neighborhood, right? They were full, they had waiting lists, they were only doing uh, virtual, sometimes patients do want in-person again. Um, those have been really hard to find. Um, and I think the other thing that I just spoke to um, our chief about last week was the geriatric population. Um, we have had a number of geriatric psychiatrists in our area close up shop, they've retired. Um, and many older patients do want to sit down with someone face to face. And so finding geriatric psychiatrists or even psychiatrists in general that are currently doing face-to-face -face work and take insurance, um, very difficult. So, you know, I think uh, one of the things we added were more care navigators to our team. So uh, across the integrated team, I've got four care navigators. Um, and really what they do is work on all of these resources, helping us help our patients get care in some way. Uh, and occasionally that does take a lot of acrobatics, a lot of research, a lot of calls. Um, are you taking new patients? What insurances do you take? When is the next opening? You know, those kinds of things. Um, and, and having care navigators has been a blessing. Yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of really, really great points you made there with that. And I mean, just, you know, one of the things that really resonated with me is like the area I'm in is, considered pretty rural, right? And so access to resources is pretty slim. Um, we have a handful of resources that we can really recommend for people. So, and psychiatry, yeah, that is a very tough thing. Even when I was in uh, Texas, really, really difficult to find. Uh, the wait list for a psychiatrist was about a year in most cases. Right. Um, pediatric, uh, 13 to 16 months. Um, geriatric, I never even heard specifically anyone who provided geriatric care. So that's how rare they were in a lot of instances. Um, so, I mean, getting connected to psychiatric services for medication management, and then, yeah, things like IOP services, group programming, residential facilities, um, so thin and few. So I, I think it's wonderful that you've been able to find, you know, some connections, you know, try to set up whatever it might be. And yeah, care managers, I mean, have such a crucial role in helping us, um, connect to, not just connect to these services, but also helping build these relationships and maintain these relationships. Absolutely. And actually, Summit hired, uh, I guess it was during the pandemic, maybe the first year, what they called a behavioral health care manager. Now, she's not on my team. She's over on care management team, but it was specifically to work with these patients who um, really needed a lot of handholding. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the role of my team to do that. And so we could at least get things rolling, but then pass along to her who would have the ability to follow up every week or every couple of days to just say, you know, have you started with that psychiatrist? Are you taking your meds? How are things going? You know, so a, another great resource. Um, and I think care management to a large degree is, is um, it's the map of the future. I mean, we need probably more care managers than we do clinicians and therapists at, at this point, I think. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. And who knows, maybe they'll even create you know, certificate programs or things like that in the IBH space for people who are bachelor's level but wanna be care navigators or care managers. It would be wonderful. Yeah, I know UMass has some training programs for care management and some of the emphasis is on integrated care. So that might be something for a resource for somebody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely such a vital component for sure. And kind of as you're pointing out too, those care management appointments, calls, whatever that might be can look so different, right? Versus for primary care clinicians, behavioral health providers, you know, we're trying to see somebody within roughly 30 minutes tops, try to get them out, out the door, get to the next person to fulfill those kind of population health goals. And at the same time, that care manager may have to be on the phone with somebody for an hour. You know, they may have to take some extra time because of kind of, as you said, that handholding, really helping that person navigate what it is that they need to navigate in that moment. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, all of us are in a, a business world too. Um, yeah. And, you know, I know there's a lot of focus on um, 
who's billing, who's not billing, how do we um, utilize what's out there? And I mean, I will say that that uh, was not new anymore, but that one code within the collaborative care codes of 99484, which is for at least 20 minutes of behavioral health care management a month has been immensely helpful to us because um, that's captured a little bit of that extra work that we're doing that otherwise would have gone unbuilt. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think that's even more, I mean, I, I think that's a really important point you bring up, Elizabeth, because any sort of, if we can bill for something, doesn't that just increase the viability of what it is that we're doing? Right, and that it creates more potential to bring on more care managers, more behavioral health providers. You know, especially when organizations do require that for the lifeblood of keeping these services going. Absolutely. I mean, generally, somewhere up at the top of most medical organizations mm -hmm. is a director of finance or a CFO, and ultimately, they want us to show at least in behavioral health anyway, that we are, um, we are bringing in as much as we're putting out, right? That it's flat. I mean, everything that I've learned from the chief of behavioral health here over the years was that in general, behavioral health departments don't make money, but your goal is to at least be flat. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to do some amount of billing. I mean, clearly we can't bill for all that we do. Um, and I think all of us who are in the helping professions would love to give it all away if we could, um, you know, but we have to show the um, bean counters that we have value. Um, and, and that value, unfortunately, um, is not only just the number of people that we talk to, but are we at least bringing in some revenue? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And another thing that you had mentioned too that kind of stuck out with me was, you know, one of the tricky parts is really how long can we follow along with a patient, right? Like, cause I mean, like the idea with PCBH is like one to five, six visits. And at that point, you know, we refer out and, you know, some organizations have the potential to do more kind of follow up longitudinal visits. Other times there's kind of some constrictions placed on that. Right. And so, you know, it sounds like the organization you're in kind of doing the best with what you all can do with kind of those like one to five visits roughly. Yeah, the the CBT model that they use in the behavioral health center um, is generally a 10 session model is what they try to stick to. So I've always encouraged my therapist, even with the IBH, within IBH to have like a very small handful of those. And when I say small, I mean like four to five patients that are kind of in the 10 session model, just yeah. so everything they're learning about CBT can be applied. I mean, we have clinicians tape sessions, those kinds of things. But other than that, um, we will do anywhere from, just like you said, one to five sessions. Sometimes that's a bridge over to behavioral health because um, you know historically they have had periods of wait lists and not surprising during COVID up and down, there were times where there was a wait list. And so let's say we couldn't get a patient into behavioral health for six to eight weeks, we might see that patient four times to just at least get them started and then turn them over if necessary. But I think on the other hand, we got really good at working very quickly. Um, and in fact, uh, all of the clinicians sort of chipped in together and we created internal homegrown three session models for certain diagnoses. So like for insomnia mm -hmm. or generalized anxiety disorder. Um, to really just try to also not only be providing counseling and therapy, but to really tap into the resources that are out there that patients could use themselves, right? Listening to podcasts, using a workbook, using an app, right? So part of those three session models, every single one was really education and showing patients what they could use on their own. Um, and it's not surprising that sometimes people got to the end of the three or four sessions and said, you know what? I think I'm good. I, I don't need behavioral health right now, um, which is the best news that we could hear, right? We did what we were supposed to do in a very short amount of time. Um, and sometimes, of course, we only get one, right? We get that one session um, in the primary care office 
and we have to maximize what we can allow that patient to walk away with them. And, and that sometimes also is work we do behind the scenes after the fact. Um, I think like most people out there, we have a portal that we communicate with patients on. So sometimes we don't have the time in that office to go over everything, but we quickly say, you know, I'd like you to check this out. I'm gonna send you this link, et cetera. And then we send it all off to them a few hours later so that even though we only saw them the one time and we don't know if they're gonna come back, they've been given some resources they can start to use on their own. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, like that's another aspect about this conversation that I really appreciate. Is like, I mean, first and foremost, we know the modal numbers one. And so, as you had mentioned earlier, kind of having this single session mindset going in, you know, and really start from the get-go, like even if we're seeing you once, we're giving you something for self-management, Some some aspect of this, right? And yeah, the, the beautiful thing about that is, as you pointed out, sometimes one session, or what, excuse me, one visit enough, is enough, sometimes two, three visits is enough for people. And yeah, those are the best outcomes, absolutely, just because we're helping people tap into their own sense of agent, self-agency, their own resources. And we're just sometimes giving them that little bit of support they need to get them on track. And as you kind of pointed out, it's it's a beautiful thing too when you can continue to follow up and yeah. help provide that support for the person, continue laying some of that early groundwork. And if you're able to make that connection to, you know, specialty mental health services or some sort of form of prolonged care, you, you've done that. And it's helped facilitate that process in a lot of helpful ways too. And I think having a name and a contact, right? Because oftentimes, and I'm sure this happens to a lot of people in the primary care space, is that a patient will talk to you that one time and then they kind of leave and you don't necessarily hear from them or know what happened. But suddenly, six months later, they pick up the phone and they call, right? And I still remember when I was in my DBH program that first semester, you know, hearing about being mental health care through the lifespan right, that you might only see someone two times and then a year later, you might see them back another time or two and then you don't see them for three years and then they come back. And we've had a number of those patients that have also used us as a lifeline mm -hmm. and they kind of circle through. Um, and that feels really great when you know that you did enough for them even one time in only 20 minutes, sometimes that they held on to your information enough to to chat with you again in the future or to say to their doctor even, I don't remember the name of that woman I spoke to last time I was in, but I have another problem. Can, can you get her on the iPad, right? I and mean, that's, that's the best. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's the, the best kind of feedback we can get when people feel they have enough safe, like trust and feel safe within the environment to, to come back in those moments when they need it and acknowledge, you know, like this place, did, I had a moment with this person. I want to come back and have another moment with this person because it really felt like it benefited me and was helpful for me in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, you know, and so again, I, I want to kind of pause for a second here and I want to just, you know, turn the floor over, see if anyone, because I know we've kind of been talking a little bit about some of the challenges, some of the approaches already that we've found helpful for addressing this increased acuity. I'm wondering if there's anyone else on this call who has had similar challenges, or maybe there's something we haven't covered yet that is maybe unique to your area, patient population, maybe even just policies that are unique for your area. We also have the chat too that I can keep an eye on as well. Corey and Elizabeth, I just wanted to interject here and let you both know that this is great, great stuff, and we are recording it, so okay. for folks that haven't been able to attend and also folks that we hear from quite often, it will be posted to the um, okay. website and accessible for everyone. Wonderful. That's great. Well, you know, and, and as we, you know, as we continue kind of this discussion and, you know, I, I definitely would love to hear again from anyone who's in the background listening right now, um, you know, or just anyone who has thoughts to share about this. You know, I think that one thing that comes to my mind when we think about how has this affected your work in primary care 
increased acuity is challenging, right? As a clinician, it is really tough if, let's say, for example, you have a series of patients back to back who are really struggling with thoughts about dying by suicide, or you have patients who clearly have a history of, let me see to check the chat. That's, that's beautiful, Julia. I'm, I'm actually like, I think this is where my mind is going with it. And I'm glad we can kind of sync up in this moment about that. Exactly. So kind of this idea of burnout where you do have consecutive patients who are struggling in a lot of different ways. And it, it does, it takes a toll, right? Like it really does as us in clinicians, especially if we're having to spend hour after hour trying to address some of this and be there with that person. And by the end of the day, it's like, this is what I've been dealing with a lot, you know? And I think Elizabeth, I, if I remember seeing on the thread, the, and this, I don't know if this was you or possibly another person commenting about, you know, trying to have more supports in place where there were people who specifically focus on that, you know, in particular, just to help kind of spread the, the, bur the burden a little bit of maybe addressing this in a lot of ways. Um, but I guess for me, kind of the question is, you know, the burnout aspect, um, really the mental kind of strain that it does, that it, the toll it takes. Um, where does your mind go with that, Elizabeth? That has been probably the thing I've thought the most about um, in mm -hmm. these last couple of years, not only from the standpoint of my people, but even myself, because I'm supervising all of them who are yeah. seeing all of these patients, right? It's incredibly stressful. Um, and so there were some things that we put in place, which again, I know that being a virtual team, um, some of the things that we had to do are not necessarily the things that other people who are sitting in primary care would be able to do. But I think the most important thing is you need to feel like you're part of a team and a community, even if you're sitting at home by yourself. Um, and so our electronic health record um, is Athena, Athena Health. And it has, you know, a chat function in it. And we started several text chats that have been incredibly helpful in building community, even amongst our team. You know, one of them was sort of the silly, make you laugh at some point during the day. Like, here's pictures of my dog. Here's pictures of my kids. This is the crazy thing that happened to me yesterday. Um, to share that stuff, because we all want to know about each other. Another one that I started, um, which I can't take credit for the idea. I was in um, Alexander Blunt's leadership program last year, and we spent an entire um, session on the importance of recognizing your people for all of the little things that they do. And so coming out of that discussion, I started a chain that was about celebrating our wins, right? And being an opportunity to just kind of go out and say, I just met with this patient and listened to this great thing that happened or they called me a week later and they're feeling so much better, or the doctor um, you know, said, I couldn't have done this without you, right? Um, so we really wanted to share those things with each other. So I think increase in communication um, was hugely important. I think I shifted a little bit in the way that I supervise um, mm -hmm. and, and still supervise. And to be quite honest, I was operating as therapist myself sometimes with my people. Um, what was amazing to me is that every single person on the team, myself included, had some sort of difficulty going on at home during the pandemic or in life, right? Um, whether it's someone's husband lost their job, my dad was dying of dementia, um, someone else had a child at home who was autistic and she was trying to work while her child was, you know, acting out all day. Um, all kinds of different things. Um, and so we just needed to support each other. And I think we really built um, some significant bonds during that time. But I also will say that in the last eight months, um, for the first time having an integrated team, I lost four people um, off my team that resigned. And so two of them wanted um, what I'm going to call more dependable work. And, and what I mean by that is people knew exactly what their day would look like when they came in. They didn't like knowing uh, or not knowing how much uh, crisis there would be in one day, how much time they would have to get their notes done. They just wanted something a little more dependable. 
Um, so two people left because of that and two people I think were just burnt out. They wanted to move into uh, an area of mental health that would not be quite as crisis laden. So, you know, I mean, I think I've heard that on other calls that I've been on, you know, nationwide about the struggles of recruiting right now. Um, we're also dealing with the issue that as virtual care has gotten so big, many therapists can just work out of their home and decide they only want to work 20 patients a week and not take any insurance. And that pays them enough, you know? So, I mean, that's certainly been a challenge. Um, I think flexible scheduling became very important. Um, you know, again, most of us now are back working, you know, a, a normal set of hours, but um, I think the pandemic really did increase focus on family. And so I have all of my people working all different kinds of situations, right? Like somebody needs two hours off in the middle of the day because that's when they need to go to their kid's school and pick them up and bring them home and get them set up for something else, right? And we're able to do that. I mean, thankfully, primary care is open from 7 a.m. to 9 at night. And so within that, we can shift around what people need. Um, I'm always encouraging people, please, please, please take your lunch hour. And even better yet, if you can go step outside and take a walk or just look at a tree or just be quiet, go do a yoga class, um, you know, breathe. Um, I think that's really important. We already mentioned more training, um, you know, getting people credit for all of the work that they're doing. Um, I think that's a, a pretty good list. I mean, I think also we had, we had to go back in these last couple months, myself and, and my senior clinician to the physician because what we heard through the grapevine was that some of the physicians hired during the pandemic who might not have got as much training on what we do prior to the pandemic thought of us as the crisis team. And so one of my clinicians was in one of the offices and, and had a conversation with a fairly new PA who said, oh, oh you mean you, you guys aren't the crisis team? And then we were like, uh-oh, we have to rebrand, remessage, right? And so we started having these um, drop-in sessions with the primary care doctors who had been here less than three years to remind them, yes, of course we will see your crisis patients, but we will see anything. You know, if someone's there because they just had their first breakup and they're 18 years old, we'll see that. We'll see the diabetic patient not taking their medication correctly. Like just a reminder, use us for everything um, because I, I want my clinicians to have a good speckling of different kinds of things through the day. Um, and again, I think this is something that only our team could do. I, I would be very curious to hear maybe how someone could take this idea and do something similar if they were in the office. But because we're a mobile team and a virtual team, we all support all of the doctors. So what I mean by that is I don't just have an office of my 10 doctors. I can take a call from any of the 200 doctors that come, comes in, right? And so as a result, what we were able to do is say, you know what, let's not just have to throw up a volunteer hand every time a call comes in, but instead we're going to set up on-call days. And so by doing that, each clinician has an on-call day where they're responsible for taking um, the majority of those crisis calls. Of course, if they get too many, we're gonna jump in and help out. Yeah. But the good news about that is it gives you four days a week that generally you're not doing crisis and you're working on all of the other stuff, right? And, and we voted on that and they really liked that. Um, so I think that's been helpful to, I mean, it's not necessarily limiting exposure, but it is saying, I'm going to get my day over with. Maybe I'll get no calls, but maybe I'll get five calls. And then I don't have to worry about it for six more days. I can breathe. Um, you know, so maybe in an in-person environment where there is a big enough team, there might be some opportunity to do something like that, that just prevents someone from being faced with it all day long, all the time. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's a lot of really great little gems and everything you just said, Elizabeth. And, 
yeah, I mean, first and foremost, social support, right? Like I love the idea of kind of having these moments where checking in with each other, sharing something like wholesome, having a laugh, doing doing something to feel like, you know, you're not in this alone and you have somebody that is there you can talk to and just kind of express what's going on, you know, and share some of that. Um, I think that's like so, so powerful. And as we know, you know, like isolation, feeling ostracized can be a really strong factor that influences burnout. Um, you know, so I think that's a really important thing. And yeah, clinicians, behavioral health clinicians, medical providers, there's a lot of folks that are, you know, experiencing high levels of burning, but burnout and making career changes, making shifts. Um, so I think that's really important. And yeah, like definitely stepping out when you can, getting, getting some some vitamin D, you know, seeing some nature, you know, taking a walk, doing something to just disrupt that normal pattern of just being within like the clinical setting, just even for a little bit can be so like profoundly huge, um, you know, and something too. And I guess for me, cause I, I appreciate what you're saying about the unique factors of having like a large virtual team, right? For me, like everything I do is pretty much in person. And so one of the nice aspects about that is that in some moments we can respond a little bit more quick in real time. And then there's other moments too, when we do have meetings, having moments just to acknowledge those small, as you were saying, those small victories, right? Also acknowledge the struggles because we don't want to act like there's not struggles because in a lot of ways that can feel like we're not acknowledging the challenging aspects of this work. That, and for a lot of people that can feel like, well, maybe it's just me struggling. Um, or like maybe it's something unique to me. So I think that's, again, like really important. Um, and then, you know, education, educate, educate, educate. I mean, even like with the setting I'm in, we have such a strong integrated model. There's still moments where I find myself educating or sharing information with, Absolutely. you know, fairly new uh, medical residents and then some folks that have been doing this for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they've also just, you know, fallen into the pattern of doing things a certain way because we know, I mean, look, primary care doctors these days are so overwhelmed. Um, mm -hmm. The amount of extra work in terms of all of the clicks and all of the metrics that they have to make sure that they cover in a, in a visit. Um, you know, some offices have more support from nurse practitioners and PAs, whereas others uh, don't necessarily. And so sometimes it's easier for them to just put in a referral to my team which means we're gonna follow up with the person via phone, but it also means that we miss that hallway handoff. And so sometimes we just have to remind them, we're not looking to hold your exam room for an hour. Um, if your staff tells us we've got five minutes, we will do what we need to do in five minutes. Um, but if the patient's asking and they're a captive audience, of course, not a surprise when we try to chase them around via phone, after the fact, we're not as great getting in touch with them as we are if we just get five minutes. You know, so just to let them know that um, it's not as onerous or as burdensome as maybe they think because they are so overwhelmed and oh, I don't even have the time to try to get the iPad set up or have this patient seen. Um, we find that if we can just hook them back in one time and show them how quickly we can work, um, they're usually back in the game. They just have to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, again, I think that's another really great thing about, you know, kind of taking this active approach, right? And helping the medical providers see like, hey, this is what we do. This is how effective we can be and efficient and how we can benefit what you're bringing to this as well. So that way you're not having to tackle all this by yourself. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And so, you know, the last thing for me on here was just, you know, and I think we've already kind of talked about this, some of these tips, right, for making the most of like your PCBH visits, um, the adjustments that have made. I feel like we've kind of interspersed this throughout our conversation here, you know, and so I guess as we're kind of like wrapping up the hour here, you know, I think there's been a lot of really, really, really great suggestions, gems, things that have been interspersed. Um, anything, Elizabeth, that's coming to your mind right now that might be something for us to kind of touch on as we end? I think any patient we talk to these days is going to have a laundry list, right? Absolutely. There is not just going to be one thing that's wrong, but there's going to be several. And I think, 
again, coming out of some of that either problem solving therapy or single session model stuff. It's like asking the patient really early on, if, if you were to leave here today and we just spent a few minutes on one of these that would really make a difference for you, what do you think the most important one is? Because we wanna make sure that we don't go down the road of working on or making suggestions on what is number five on their list when really we missed out on number one. Um, you know, so I, I think trying to rein in what appears to be a very large bucket of items mm -hmm. and just sometimes pick one or, you know, even as we think about like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs type thing, what is the most critical to this person's mental health? And then how do we work? And again, it may not be through therapy. It may be through care management or concrete services, but how do we get this person on the very first stage or step of recovery, whatever that's going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. I love the intentionality with this and, you know, the collaborative decision-making, right? Like that's, that's such an important thing, you know, and I would add, you know, to what you've said so eloquently already too, we're having a moment with somebody, right? Like we're really having this interaction that can be so profound for this person, you know, that it's like, because like we're giving them that chance to focus on something that's just really important for them in a lot of ways, like it, it can just be such a pivotal experience for them. So like, I definitely, I love what you're saying about kind of having that single session mindset, maintaining that. And at the same time, having that moment where that person really does feel heard, validated and getting their needs, some need addressed that's really important to them. I love that. As we know, right? Just having someone listen and validate even for all of us is so incredibly important. And that first and foremost is what we always do is give them some space to just be themselves and be heard. And if we're the ones lucky enough to get that moment, um, we may just see the image in their mind of what a mental health provider of some sort looks like, and they'll be more likely to accept help in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm going to have that be our mic drop moment. And Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I think this was such a wonderful conversation and the insights you shared and some of the gems. I just, a lot of gratitude for having you on this call with us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thank you thank all you. for attending. Quite thank nice. you both, um, Elizabeth and Corey. This was, this was a great conversation. I'm excited to get it um, posted so that others can uh, listen to it as well. And thank you everyone for joining that was able to be here. Hopefully we'll see you all in Arizona in a few months. I'll be there. Wonderful. All right, I will too. I'll see y'all later. Take care. Bye-bye.